All right, to recap where we're at um, uh, within this lecture here, uh, we've had the, the rise of the Federalist Party and the rise of the Republican Party over Hamiltonian fiscal policy with the National Bank and the Assumption Program. Um, this is going to basically be a political contest between these two political par parties going back and forth um, in various elections until we get to, until we get to the era of good feeling. Now the Federalist Party is definitely weakened early on um, with the Adams administration with the XYZ affair and the Alien Sedition Act, but it's still a, a main player. Um, and party politics until we get to about 1816, where we get into the so-called era of good feeling, uh, which lasts up to 1824. And the reason for this is that the Democratic Republicans uh, had a more seemly rhetoric. Uh, they weren't as harsh and as elitist in their rhetoric, and they adopted many of the Federalist ideas. They adopted the the bank, the, the National Bank, the Second National Bank under Madison. They had adopted a protective tariff as Madison or as Hamilton had put forward, the leader of the Federalist Party. And so by the time we get to 1816, the Federalist Party is uh, is history. Right. And so it's one party, the the uh, Democratic Republicans, until we get to the um, uh, the election of until we get to the election after 1824, when Jackson is running for office, and he is going to find the Democratic Party um, mainly in about 1825, um, and by 1828, when we get to the election of Jackson, uh, we are going to see this new party emerge called the Democratic Party. So in this learning objective, learning objective five, we're going to discuss the rise and the fall of the Whig Party and show how its downfall led to the creation of the modern day Republican Party. Um, so the controversies that revolved around Andrew Jackson stimulated the formation of the second American Party system. So we're still in this kind of one party system mainly even though we have the emergence of the new Democratic Party, it's still kind of an offshoot of the Democratic Republican Party. Um, we're going to see this new party um, give rise in opposition to what was known as um, King King um, Andrew Jackson right here. Um, people that just did not like um, Andrew Jackson. So we'll begin to see that in 1832. So the term Whig was first used in 1832 by the anti-tariff leaders of the South Carolina um, with the whole nullification crisis, you know, the tariff of 1828 that emerged. But it soon came to be applied to all elements that found themselves opposed to Jacksonian, the Jacksonian Democratic Party. The Whigs first emerged as an identifiable group in the Senate where Clay and Calhoun joined forces in 1834 um, to pass a motion censoring Jackson for his removal of federal deposits from the Second Bank of the United States. So the Whigs soon evolved into a potent national political force by attracting other groups into a loose coalition alienated by Jackson. So you had National Democratic Republicans who supported Clay, um, Adams, um, and the American system. Southern planters and state rights folks, so people that were very angered by uh, Jackson's stance on nullification, right, uh, opposing Calhoun, so Calhoun is able to attract a lot of people to oppose uh, Jackson. You also have um, northern industrialists that are going to get involved in this who were also worried about Jackson's stance on the Second National Bank and basically closing it down. Um, and so they basically all had one thing in common uh, despite all of their differences and different reasons for um, hating Andrew Jackson. They all viewed him as a tyrant and he quickly got this um, nickname as King Andrew the first, right? And so this political cartoon right here becomes quite famous. Um, the 
political beliefs of the Whigs was America is a classless society. There is, um, even though you have rich people, you have poor people, everybody has the ability to move up within the system. Uh, elites should govern since that is natural as the Whigs would see it and promoted industrialization and economic growth um, as the basis of their political vision. So the Southern Whigs, represented by Calhoun, argue that the Northern Whig ideal of equal opportunity contradict the realities of slavery and of industrial society. Calhoun felt that Southern slave owners and Northern factory owners belong to the same privileged class and face the same threat from below. He therefore urged Northern factory capitalists to join a defensive alliance with the planters. As Calhoun saw it, um, social harmony was possible only with recognition, acceptance, and reinforcement of existing sharp uh, distinctions of class. Whigs, he argued, ought to unite around a common defense of privilege and social order. The significance of the Whig Party was that it was a national party that represented the interests of both a large industrial, industrialist and planter aristocracy at once, and provided a means by which two economic groups could possibly work out differences. Uh, and so the true significance here is that this is going to um, create a party of national interest. Uh, the Whigs criticized Jackson and the Democrats for underestimating uh, possibilities for upward mobility and for pitting the poor against the rich and for disrupting social harmony. And so, they, they're, although they argue that their class is the one that should be in charge, they're, they're arguing that, that anybody could get could rise up to their class. And the thing that they didn't like about Jackson is he, in his political rhetoric, he was always talking about how the rich, the bankers and the industrialists and the, the final financial marketeers have rigged the system against the common person. You hear this rhetoric today. The Whigs said that that was, um, that that was unnecessarily um, antagonizing and detracted from national interests. So they attacked J Jackson's strong presidency by warning against strong, highly individualistic executives. And so he, what Jackson had done in, in the eyes of the Whigs was he had put himself uh, first and foremost in part um, as a name brand almost in the executive branch. As an alternative, the Whigs offered legislative rule and a program of governmental intervention in the economy. They wanted to see a more vigorous national government with Congress rather than the U.S. president exercising leadership. They attempted to turn Jackson's Republican rhetoric against him. They were able to do this against Jackson's successor, Martin Van Buren, a little bit more successful um, in the le election of 1840, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The Whigs found, uh, to their delight, that the Panic of 1837 is going to give them kind of an in towards the White House. And the rapid industrialization that had taken place in the United States marked an impact on um, the Whigs' politics here. So the industrialization that had taken place had strengthened the commitment of the urban middle class and prosperous planters um, um, from the north to the values of the business elite, to the Whig party, um, and to, to their economic programs of the American system. Again, the bank, protective tariffs, and an infrastructure prov um, provided by the federal government. With William Henry Harrison's presidential victory over Martin Van Buren in the election of 1840, the Whigs' political future looked very bright. So this guy right here um, is going to win the presidency of Van Buren. Let me bring that guy's picture up real quick. So, he's so this guy right here, Martin Van Buren, becomes president after Jackson. And he's basically Jackson's um, 
predecessor. He's basically handpicked by Jackson, and the defeat of Martin Van Buren by William Henry Harrison in 1841, when he assumes the presidency, represents an end to Jacksonian po um, politics. All right. So the Whigs, though, unfortunately lost their opportunity, their political opportunity here, when Harrison died of pneumonia in 1841. Uh, one month after his inauguration, I guess he, the story is, is that he was, it was raining during his inauguration and he stayed out and reveled, um, partied uh, in celebration of his inauguration a little bit too long and contracted pneumonia and died a month later. His successor was Vice President John Taylor, this guy right here, um, who, um, a Virginian who was not a true supporter of the American system, as we'll, we would find out. Uh, and sometimes this guy, John Tyler, is um, described as America's worst president of the United States history, right? And so um, let's take a look at why that might be the case. Uh, Tyler opposed the urban commercial interests in his own state and had become a Whig because of his disgust with Jackson's nationalism and his own enthusiasm for states' rights. Um, and so he basically went against uh, Jackson when Jackson um, opposed nullification. As president, Tyler's prime objective was to block the national, nationalizing economic program of his own party. He succeeded vetoing two bills supported by Henry Clay to reestablish the National Bank. He also blocked major protective tariffs. So he's, or he knocks out two of, the, uh, two of the legs of the American system right away as uh, when he assumes the presidency of the United States, unelected too, he's, uh, he's vice president. Um, and he's, doing, he's taking charge in this way. Tyler limited Whig successes to repeal of the independent treasury in 1841 and a modest increase in tariffs in 1842. So as a result, the Whig party broke with Tyler and his cabinet resigned with the exception of Secretary of State Daniel Webster. Uh, Tyler appointed Democrats to place, re replace them, but kept Webster in the cabinet in order to maintain a tie with New England and to claim uh, he had bipartisan support. And so the Whig party is in disarray because they have this, what they perceive as a renegade, John Tyler, in the White House. So with this debacle, in 1844, James K. Polk, a Jacksonian Democrat from Tennessee, defeated the Whig candidate Henry Clay in the presidential election. So Henry Clay, um, who has been desiring the presidency for all of these years, is going to be get defeated out by James K. Polk, mainly because it looks like the Whigs don't know what they're doing. They have this guy who's defeating all of the Whigs' legislation, uh, Tyler in the presidency, and it just looks like an inept president. And this guy here is promising to go after Mexico and Great Britain to get um, the rest of the continental United States that we know of existence today, right? Texas and California um, and the Puget Sound of Washington and Oregon, those territories as well. Um, the, and so the issue of annex, annexation of Texas and the extension of slavery into the Western territories um, in time pr proved a menace to the solidarity of the Whig Party. The stage was now set for the replacement of Clay's American system by the issue of free soil, which was keeping slavery out of the new territories as the central economic issue, um, which will be later adopted by the uh, coming Republican Party. The new issue led to sectional disputes um, between the Southern Whigs, the Cotton Whigs, who were pro-slavery as opposed to Northern Whigs uh, who, or co uh, conscious Whigs who opposed the expansion of slavery. And so these differences emerged when uh, Taylor was president 
And so you had conscious Whigs who opposed the extension of slavery. So they opposed Taylor because they thought he wanted to expand slavery westward, and he did. Um, and then you had cotton Whigs who linked linked to northern cloth manufacturers who needed southern cotton, supported Taylor, and voted with the southern Whigs, um, which is in turn going to um, create this another wing of what was at first the Whig Party is going to eventually um, evolve into the Republican Party, but the so-called Free Soil Party, which opposed slavery in the western states, which formed a, a the conscious Whigs and the anti-slavery Democrats, uh, this coalition. So during the 1840s, uh, conflict over the legal status of slavery resulted when both Northerners and Southerners moved into Western areas that were to be organized as territories in preparation for statehood. To Southern planners, the chance that Americans could seize Northern Mexico and secure it for slavery seemed a possible solution to their anxiety over the abolitionist threats to slavery. The South's ambitions produced um, a major fracture in the Whig Party and a lesser break in the Democratic Party between the Southern, uh, the Southerners loyal to slavery and the Northerners who supported the free soil. So during the 1840s and 50s, as both Northern and Southern Whigs became more entrenched in their positions, they drove a wedge between themselves that undermined the party's national base. The end of the Whigs uh, came uh, and the American National Two-Party System uh, comes to an end in the 1850s um, with the uh, passage of the, 18, of the Compromise of 1850, um, which made California uh, a free state when, once, we, once America won the war, um, the Mexican-American War, and they got the, ter the territory from northern Mexico, made California a free state and allowed for the fugitive slaves to be returned to their owners from the north. The Whigs per party barely survived as a result of hard feelings and lack of trust that developed out of the debate and the formation of the Compromise. Uh, four years later, you're going to have the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Uh, and I'm going to go into more details in the next lecture on this in, in our final unit in these acts. But suffice to say for now, it, it, which provide, basically it provided for the possibility of slavery in the Kansas uh, Territory, which had been forbidden under the Missouri Compromise. Right? And so... Um, and, it, and this is basically the debate that emerges out of this is effectively going to destroy the, the Whig Party and it's going to give rise to the formation of the modern day Republican Party. And they're, they're going to adopt the Northern Whigs and the Democrats that were arguing for free soil. Um, the idea that um, the territories should not be used for uh, the expansion of slavery. So Republicans viewed the unsettled West as a land of opportunities, a place to which the ambitious and hardworking could migrate in hopes of approving their social and economic positions. So free soil would serve as a guarantee of free competition or uh, the right to rise. Uh, but if slavery was permitted to expand, the rights of free labor would be not denied. Slaveholders would monopolize the best land, use their slaves to compete unfairly with free white workers, um, and block efforts at commercial and industrial development. Some Republicans also pandered to race prejudice. They, re they presented their policies as a way to keep blacks out of the territories, thus preserving the new lands for exclusive white occupancy. Right. Um, and this would be the stance of, of, this would be just reflect kind of modern white identity at that time. Um, although the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act raised the territorial issue and gave birth to the Republican Party, it was the turmoil associated with, the, with attempts to implement popular sovereignty in Kansas. And this is this idea that uh, 
the, and this is basically the the, core, the popular sovereignty is basically saying that hey, if people want to vote for slavery there, they should be able to vote for slavery. If they want a free state, they should be able to vote for that. This is going to undermine the Missouri Compromise, which said anything above the 30, 36, 36, 30 longitude latitude lines should be a free state. Um, um, and so basically, in Kansas, that kept the issue alive and enabled the Republicans to increase their following throughout the North um, and to become a strong second party by the election of 1856. The sectional quarrel deepened and became virtually um, irreconcilable in, in the years between um, the Democrats' election of Buchanan in 1856 um, and the Republican victories with Lincoln in 1860. A series of incidents provoked one side or the other heightened the tensions and ultimately brought the crisis to a head. Behind the panic reactions of public events lay a growing sense that the North and the South were so different in culture and so opposed in basic interests that they could no longer coexist in the same nation, right? And so these issues are really becoming to, to the sectional issues between the North and the South are really coming to a head in the 1850s. And when the Republican Party are able to capture um, the White House in 1860 with Lincoln's presidency, uh, the South is not going to be able to reconcile um, the differences with the North anymore, and then we're going to see secession. It's going to lead to war. Now we're going to go into um, further detail in the next lecture, um, specifically how the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, um, the rise of the abolitionist movement. Um, uh, the Mexican War itself, uh, and the next lecture, how all of that contributes specifically to tensions over the issue of slavery between the North and the South. But this concludes uh, the last learning objective for this lecture. So let me know if you have any questions. Talk to you later.